It's June 7th, 2019. I'm David Menzies. This is Jessica Swetanowski, and you're watching Battleground. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I know you're expecting to see our commander here, Ezra Levant, but Ezra is, um, how do we say, on assignment. That's what we say, right, Jessica, when somebody's deciding to take a day off, go to see the movies, sit on a beach. Actually, no, folks. Ezra's way, way too hardworking for that. He really is on an assignment somewhere, I think, out in the prairies. And he'll be back, of course, on Monday. And for the first time ever as a co-host on Battleground, it is Jessica. And I'm so glad to have you here, Jessica. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Got some big shoes to fill, but I think, <laughs> I think we got this down. Well, I don't want to brag, folks, but I do take a size 13 double E. And it's hard getting uh, shoes like that, let me tell you. And my, right now, my feet are screaming. But, you know, um, we should uh, uh, mention, uh, folks, that uh, Jessica is our newest rebel here. Uh, you might already be familiar with her on her outstanding coverage of the Tommy campaign. Uh, we just... Uh, took Jessica, we threw her right into a baptism of fire in terms of uh, covering uh, Tommy's campaign over in Bryn. And wow, Jessica, can we briefly reflect, what was it like, you know, going out to, you know, you're in a foreign land, it's a foreign election, um, people that, um, well, I guess sometimes you could barely understand that they were speaking English <laughs> given the, the extent of the accents, but give us a, a thumbnail uh, uh, capsulization of what that experience was like. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of funny because already I'm looking through the comments and uh, I see a lot of, oh, Tommy, Tommy. <laughs> so I feel like I've been a little bit branded. It's staying with me, which is great, um, which actually just shows the amount of support that I got there. You know, I did go in as a new journalist and I, I tried to do my best. <laughs> I did my best and um, I tried to talk to everybody there involved. Yep. Um, of course, one side was a little friendlier than the other. Um, but yeah, it was a definitely a great experience, learned a lot, and I think it was a, a great start for me. And I'm very excited to go back. I'll be back for uh, the, Tommy's next trial, which is July 4th. So I'll be back in the UK for that. Yes. I'll be reporting on his trial and looking forward to seeing a lot of probably similar faces. Yes, the Tommy trial, a.k.a. the never-ending story. Now, I, I'll just briefly add in, Jessica, I thought, and if you haven't seen any of uh, Jessica's reports, folks, uh, it, it's well worth uh, going back into the archives and taking a peek. But, And this, I think, ties into some of the things that we're going to speak to uh, today on Battleground, the whole idea of freedom of speech and expression and the war, the ongoing war on many fronts, on freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And the, the war on one front that Jessica uh, ran into was the police. And I'm talking about a day in which there was a counter protest to Tommy and Jessica was merely trying to do her job as a journalist. You walked over to speak to the other side, which is what you do in journalism. You get both sides of the story. And what did that female police officer tell you? So she stopped me from getting close enough to the protesters and um, I asked her if I can talk to the protest. She said yes, but from several feet away, which <laughs> would, you know, make me end up screaming at a group of people. And uh, it's kind of funny because my re response was um, a very technical um, <laughs> reporter kind of mindset. I said, well, my mic won't catch the yes. audio from there. <laughs> so. And she didn't seem to have a problem with that. Yeah. And, and so uh, I guess what I'm leading up to, folks, is that um, the police officer was basically lumping Jessica in with uh, the, the rank and file of the Tommy camp, not looking at her as an independent journalist, and making that arbitrary decision on the, f on the fly. Basically, the fact that a journalist um, like Jessica, as opposed to somebody from The Guardian or the BBC, might ask some, oh, you know, insensitive questions, I'm going to step in as a state-appointed censor on the fly and shut you down. Jessica, I thought that was absolutely brutal. She had no right to do that, no authority to do that, and uh, I could only imagine what you were thinking uh, in the heat of the battle. Yeah, it was like you can see in the video, I was a little bit surprised and I was confused by her instruction because it just didn't make sense to me. I wanted to talk to, um, just simply talk, have a conversation yes. with the protesters. It looks like we did actually just get a $2 um, 
So, what, it's super chat super donation. Super chat. That's right. So it looks like see Doku Mad Max for Prime Minister. Hashtag free speech. Well, so talk about free speech. <laughs> in the UK, it seems like it doesn't exist, so we're still fighting for it here in Canada. You, you know what? Um, and, and thank you very much for your uh, donation. And if anyone wants to make a super chat, uh, please do. Unlike um, the CBC with their $1.5 billion welfare check, and of course, what's going to be a $600 million um, uh, a subsidy to others in the mainstream media, uh, we don't take a cent of the taxpayer dollar, nor would we, even if we were eligible. <laughs> Eligible to, uh, so if you can, you know, throw in a, a buck or two, we, we are gratefully appreciative of that. And by the way, uh, we are going to get back to the the, the, the second segment uh, regarding uh, Max Bernier and his thoughts on free speech. I got an exclusive interview with Max Bernier on Tuesday in Ottawa after the Section 13 dog and pony uh, fiasco of a circus took place. Like I said, we'll weigh in on that a little later on. But the first topic du jour, and it is, in a way, a free speech issue. Uh, I covered the annual Hate Fest uh, with my cameraman Efren on Saturday. And that's the, um, the Made in Iran holiday, if you will, um, in which uh, basically uh, they want the, uh, they, well, they want Israel to cease existing is the easy way. It's a very anti-Semitic, uh, hate-filled event. Event. It is shocking to see it happen and try. I can tell you the good news is, folks, I would say the attendance was probably down 50% compared to last year. And I was there for it last year, too. That's the good news, that it's not growing. Um, but we came across, and uh, Mr. Producer is probably going to uh, show a, a clip here. Is this maybe the, um, the new way uh, how protests are going to uh, uh, come to be in the future. I know Joe Warmington, the wonderful columnist of the Toronto Sun, he tweeted out that question that our protest is going to come with pamphlets and posters saying these are the approved media people to talk to and these are the unapproved media. Do not say a word. Check it out. Well, what do you know, folks? I am honored. I am right here in with the, I guess, Palestinian News Network. This man makes fake news. Do not speak to him, just say no. How do you like that? And let's see, um, boycott Israel, Al-Quds, Toronto, and uh, something about a Saudi-Israel alliance. You know what, this is what, also of course, brick by brick, wall by wall, apartheid has to fall. This is the thing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you call Israel an apartheid state, your entire argument is based on a law. If there's any apartheid, it's in the Arab world. I mean, for goodness sakes, if you're gay, if you're a woman, you do not have the same rights as those who live in Israel. So, in effect, I'm actually quite honored that my, uh, my face is being reproduced like that. Um, I'll wear it as a badge of honor, actually. Do not speak to him, just say no. So you've, you've taken a vow of silence. Isn't this gonna hurt you spewing your hateful messages? Is it just nodding back and forth? Is hey, do you know where I can get one of those? I'm sure, I've ever seen of myself. It looks just like you. I think so. You know, it's pretty good. Yeah, it is. It looks pretty good. Ma'am, why are all these people trying to shut you down? Is it because you're a woman? No, absolutely not. They can't really seem to articulate their point. They just scream a word over and over. I can't hear. It's insane, isn't it? I gotta tell you, I'm, 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 I'm kind of getting a vibe of a, like a Hollywood celebrity, and it's like the paparazzi. Everyone's filming me for some reason. By the way, if you see this man, do not speak to him, okay, sir? I don't know him. If you see this man, do not talk to him. Fair enough. Thank you. Guys, if you see this man, do not talk to him. Who is this? Yeah, I know. He's, he's, he's a, a perfect... He says this man makes fake news. Do not talk to him. If you see this man, do not speak to him, okay? Sir, this is very serious. What, what's so funny? I thought you were one of the only guys who was not fake news. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would happen? He gets it. You know, you know folks... 
I can tell you off camera, the hardcore organizers, they were going crazy because I think in the face of insanity, um, what you do is you either ignore it or you make fun of it, you mock it. Uh, you don't treat it seriously and I think their agenda was to uh, break me somehow. Uh, I don't know, make me cry, make me go away pouting they don't like me. Uh, instead, I took ownership of the do not talk to this man, the maker of fake news poster, and boy, I had a good time at their expense. But you know, Jessica, I just wonder if that's the template for uh, protests moving forward where they actually have posters out there cherry picking which members of the media to talk to and not to talk to. I mean, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised they's, they're already making posters with your face on it, so I feel like they'll put anything on a poster at this point. Um, just catching up on the super chat here, so uh, Proud Boys Calgary actually is is sent us uh, $13.99 for a beer for us each. Oh, so nice. there you go. Hello from Calgary. Enjoy Jessica's reports on Tommy's MEP campaign. Also enjoying David's Toronto Streeters. Here's a beer for both of you. Proud of your boy. Fantastic. Make mine a Molson Stock Ale. I had Mr. Producer, I think we won, I won a bet against him, and he went out to try to buy it at the, the beer store, and of course the beer store displaying their usual efficiency was out of stock everywhere he went, but uh, that's a good beer, folks. Let me tell you, you don't have to go to that artsy craft beer all the time. Some of the mass-produced stuff is wonderful. Yeah, craft beer is for us millennials. Th that's don't, right, don't yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Surrender, $5. Why do you think YouTube is stifling, out, stifling speech at the same, at the same week uh, that the antitrust investigation is announced? It doesn't seem like a wise strategy on their part. Well, you know what? First of all, guys, thank you again for your generous donations. And I want to speak about uh, antitrust because I think... You know, as we move uh, into the years ahead, I think one of the most profound debates is going to be uh, free speech in the public square or the cyber square, if you will. And I think with the um, oligopoly that we see in Silicon Valley, you know, I'm talking Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google, what have you. Um, I think they might run the risk, and you might even think that President Trump would be the kind of president with the testicular fortitude to do this, and it's what happened to Standard Oil more than a century ago in the United States. Standard Oil was effectively a near monopoly control, controlling the uh, petrol business in the United States, and it was broken into, I believe it was 31 separate companies in the name of competition. And I think the tech giants run the risk of U.S. antitrust law being applied, especially since in the U.S. they have the First Amendment guaranteeing free speech, something certainly uh, there was no amendment about oil production in the Constitution during the Standard Oil breakup. But you know, it, it is amazing, Jessica, the, um, uh, the hypocrisy on the left. Suddenly, you know, the left, which always believes in bailouts and subsidies and, and welfare of various flavors for everyone, suddenly when it comes to the tech giants kicking off right of center uh, websites and uh, performers, uh, deplatforming them, suddenly they subscribe to the mantra, oh, let the free market economy uh, sort things out. We don't need government interference yeah. here. When it's going their way, uh, suddenly they're free market capitalists. Well, yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't really have it both ways, can you? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just astounded by that. And uh, but again, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, this is going to become a huge issue in the months and years ahead. Going back to Al Quds, I had fun with the uh, "Don't talk to the Menzoid" posters. Didn't have fun, although I will admit I appreciated his candor, his frankness, his honesty. But I spoke to somebody, he said he was university educated at the U of uh, T. Um, he is a Canadian citizen from another land. And I was absolutely shocked about his, him advocating for Sharia law and a certain absolutely bone chilling part of Sharia law he wants to see enacted in Canada in the 21st century. What, what would happen to a gay couple in Palestine, sir? What? What would happen to a gay couple in Gaza? They executed ex according to Islamic law. Really? Islam doesn't in endorse gayism. Islam doesn't endorse homosexuality. Well, Just like Canada doesn't endorse a lot of things. And do you think that's good? If I were to... Do you think that's good, sir? Do you think it's good for gays? In Canada, I would get executed, right? 
I, I would get per per prosecuted. In the same way, Islam doesn't approve of being gay. I see. Okay, so would you like to see Sharia law in Canada replace Canadian law? At some point it will. You know, because we, are, we, are, we have families, we are making babies. You're not. You're, 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 your population is going down the slump. That's right. Right? Yeah. And by 2060, by 2060, according to Pew Research Institute, yeah. your research, by 2060, Muslims will be the biggest religious group the world over. Right. What are you going to do then? Are Actually, you going to oppose Sharia is even then? Well, are you know you, what? Are I, you still going to I, I'm, Sharia I'm very appreciative of the honesty. We don't usually get that. I'm just trying to get my head around what you just said, that yeah. you don't have any problem with gay people being executed just because of their sexual orientation. No, I don't understand that. You don't have any problem with, with Muslims being executed just because of being Muslims. That does not happen, sir. It, it happened to me. It's very, it was very... Uh, like, Wait a minute. You were executed? You're back from the dead? No, I'm not from the dead. I'm just saying, I, I, despite being a Canadian citizen, like I'm telling you my own experience, at times I've been treated unfairly. I don't... I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, no, really, I'm sorry to hear that. Muslims in Canada get treated unfairly every single day, whether it's job, whether it's admissions in universities, whether it's something else. You know, they, there is unfairness. There is racial profiling here. Well, but, but see, I think that's the difference between you and I. I don't want any unfairness, even because you're a Muslim. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to see people being executed for their sexual orientation. Okay, why? Why would you want that, sir? No, no, no. Why would you not want people like... You know, it's because of these abnormal sexual orientations that your population is going down the, the slump as, as, as we are growing everywhere. Like I said, folks, I found that bone chilling that somebody was saying that in the public square with a with a degree of pride and I'm kicking myself because I, I did learn that he has children and I think the obvious question uh, Jessica would have been for me to ask him if one of your kids had come out of the closet or were, was to come out of the closet and say they were gay what's it going to be a your unconditional love as a father for your child to accept that child or b according to Quranic law um, there has to be an execution here, maybe you know what's termed as an, an honor killing. I wonder how he would have answered that question. Yeah, I have no idea, but the answer could have been scary. Yeah, to be honest. you know, yeah. maybe if I see him again, I'll ask him that question. Uh, uh, but uh, um, again, bone chilling, and uh, I think you have a couple of super chats. Yes. Yeah, so Mr. Surrender is actually back here with two dollars. Thank you. And it says, Thank by you. the way, Jess, are we still on for that interview? You have to forgive me. I'm going to blame the jet lag. But if you shoot me another email or direct message, I'm sure I'll get back to you. She's very popular, <laughs> folks. You know, you got to keep reminding her about these things. And <laughs> and uh, we have Shirley Rose Lee with $5. Thank you. And we have Kings of Kings, Jesus777 with a dollar. Oh, well, Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. E e every bit he helps. That was an interesting number combination. A, a King of Jesus, seven, so I guess that trumps 666, yes, right? Yes, I yeah. assume so. So that, that, that is fantastic. Uh, thank you again for all those super chats. Really appreciate it. Um, what, um, the, in addition to the, um, how odious that uh, fellow speech was about uh, wanting to kill gays in Canada under Sharia law, it comes in stark contrast, folks, to two other free speech issues that were dealt with severely and immediately, whereas this fellow seems to be getting a pass. One was um, on Sunday after the um, Raptors game, uh, there was a man on the street interview by you know the fans ex ex exiting the, um, uh, the, the stadium. And one guy, I, I assume he was drunk, he said the du rigueur, and I'm not going to repeat it on air, you, you know what I'm talking about, uh, it, it, it's very much a cliche thing to say, uh, and he said about another uh, player's wife, uh, we're going to F her right in the you know, private part area. The thing is, folks, uh, this has been going on for years. It was not funny the first time it was said. It's not funny now. It is a joke without a punchline, and it will never get funny no matter how much it's repeated. People um, in the past have been outed and lost their jobs over this. I'm not advocating for that, by the way. Uh, I believe 
in free speech as an absolutist that you have the right uh, to be vulgar, uh, to be gross. Uh, my line in the sand on free speech has always been when you advocate for the harm or death of a certain person or uh, identifiable group. But nevertheless, this guy turned himself in to the police yesterday and has been charged. We'll see what the penalty is, likely a slap on the wrist. Then we had, um, uh, about a day or two after, uh, a street preacher, uh, Reverend Lynn, go into Toronto's gay village, there he is, and he was simply preaching the Christian gospel. He was not advocating hatred or harm or and making any kind of derogatory comments. As you can see, here is the police coming in, and uh, well, wouldn't you know it, folks, he is uh, arrested and spent a really rough night in jail, and he's been charged with several offenses too. Um, Jessica, I, I find the double standard absolutely, well, let's put it this way, I'm not surprised because Islam is increasingly becoming a criticism-free zone. We dare not say anything negative about Islam because the very worst thing you can be is an Islamophobe. That it trumps everything. So the fact that this guy, um, uh, the, the Muslim that, the, uh, man that I interviewed at um, a protest where there was no permit, uh, where they shut down major thoroughfares illegally, um, where they were not given a bill for the policing costs as city council said they would be, would say that is, is completely egregious. But uh, again, um, the, the drunken Raptors fan that said the effer slur, the street preacher simply uh, preaching Christianity, um, they get charged criminally. What's your take on this? Well, it's it's a huge double standard. We all see that. And but I'm I'm curious at that protest or at that protest or that rally. Were there? Um, did you notice a lot of police there? Were there any counter protesters? Oh, at the Al Quds mm -hmm. thing. Yes, there was a. Uh, as always, there was a smaller counter protest, folks, of uh, uh, Jewish people, pro-Israel people, um, and the. Um, uh, and, certain, and, and they were kind of uh, sequestered off to the side. So there was indeed a counter protest, um, but certainly uh, we did that interview in high def. Uh, it's, uh, it's received an enormous amount of views. It's being uh, retweeted even by um, what I like to call my kind of Muslim, which is um, Tarek Fatah and the Imam uh, Tawidi uh, saying, look at this, here is uh, one of the problems in the community. And um, yeah, there is a double standard. I think in the big picture, folks, I think the question is this. He is right when he talks about the demographics showing how, and Islam is the fastest growing religion. And I think, uh, Jessica, this goes one of two ways. Um, you know, by the time we go to 2016, uh, I'll be six feet under. You'll still be a very accomplished journalist in that year, I'm assuming. But it goes one of two ways in that there will be an Islamification of the West where you actually see, we see in UK, 85 Sharia courtrooms, right? We either see that happening or we see a younger generation of Muslims. Kids saying, you know what? You know, I really dig um, rock music. You know, I really want to dress fashionably. I don't want to wear a, a burqa or, 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 or a niqab. Um, you know, I want to be free. I, I want to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And what I'm saying is that there is a rejection of the older generation. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'm living in Candyland here, uh, but that is my fervent hope that this kind of hardcore Sharia Islam is rejected by a young generation that simply, like all kids, you know, just wants to have fun and do all the cool stuff. What do you think about that? Well, I, def I, ha I definitely have the same hope. Um, my parents are immigrants from Poland. They came here, and one of the proudest moments I had, somebody asked uh, my dad, obviously with a heavy accent, and they asked uh, where, like, what his background is, and he said, well, I'm from Poland, but we're Canadian now. <laughs> and like it was such a nice, <laughs> like um, a proud moment of mine, because it is, it is important to, you are in Canada, we have our laws, and it is, um, in that video that we just showed, I don't know if we showed that clip, but he does talk about, that Muslim does talk about um, how they're having lots of kids. 
Yes. You know, West like Christians and um, just secular people here in Canada aren't having as many kids. Oh, 100%. And, you know, some people will call that a crazy conspiracy theory, like, oh, we're scared that we're going to die out eventually. But that's actually the reality. A hundred percent. You see, uh, and of course, that was the, the premise for Mark Stein's incredible book, a fantastic read, but a chilling read, nevertheless, America Alone, because basically uh, to replace your own population uh, via the birth rate, it has to be, I think, at least 2.2, 2.3. And of the Western nations uh, Mark Stein examined, including Canada, they're all below two. America alone had uh, a 2.3, I believe, uh, birth rate, so it could replace its own population without having to rely on immigration. And yeah, this is the worry that if uh, with families, uh, uh, Muslim birth rates are indeed much higher. Um, that's why in 2060 you're going to see the population uh, tilt that way. And this is where, you know, one of my fears, uh, Jessica, is I think hijacking planes, blowing things up, driving a truck apiece into a crowd, I think that's amateur hour. Why, why blow up the infrastructure and create mass murder when you can use soft jihad, soft sharia, which is to get into the system, the education system, the political system, the policing system, and change things legally from within, and the next thing you know, we're living under a, a Sharia state. I think that's the end goal, and that is better accomplished when you are actually in the majority, numbers-wise. Oh, definitely, and that's, I, that's a strategy they are taking. Mm. There, I've seen several videos of Muslim um, men and women talking about how they are using Canada's democracy yes. as a tool, as a tool to eventually implement Sharia. A hundred percent. And you know, another thing about that interview, if you go look at it, um, he, uh, another thing that really bothered me was that he admitted on camera that he didn't actually take the citizenship oath. Now, I thought, you know, foolish me, maybe I didn't get the most recent memo from uh, uh, our, our immigration minister. I thought that was mandatory. You had to take that oath. Here we have him on camera saying he didn't. And I'm telling you, Jessica, uh, to further my point that I said just a few minutes ago, I wouldn't be surprised if not in my lifetime, but your lifetime, our liberals in power say, you know what, this thing about citizenship oaths and pledging allegiance to the queen, you know, it's kind of culturally insensitive to certain people. Well, let, let's let that slide. Let's make it optional. What do you think? I think that's definitely an option. Yeah. <laughs> where, where we're going to head. Yeah, definitely. I can totally see that. You know, it's to try and cut out yeah, any kind of, you know, Western, westernized um, strategy there. So I can totally see that, that it's, yeah, it would be an option because, you know, political correctness is the way to go and we don't want to offend immigrants coming in to our country. And if you think Jessica and I are, you know, raising an alarmist bell and going off on a tangent, I have proof in that particular pudding, folks. It just happened with an announcement uh, two days ago by the Toronto District School Board, which is the largest school board in the country. And this announcement was made public, oh, talk about bad, bad timing, on the 75th anniversary of D-Day, one of the most important historical events in the 20th century. And it was this. Um, if you're standing for O Canada at a Toronto District School and you don't want to remove your cap, Hey, no harm, no foul. What you gonna do? Uh, Jessica, we can't even imagine the sacrifices of those men of the greatest generation uh, back 75 years ago when they stormed the beaches of Normandy. Um, you know, if it, I, I thought the, the most brilliant scene in Saving Private Ryan is the opening where it really captured what it was like. You're jumping out of a ship in rough seas, rushing onto a beach as thousands of German bullets with the ostensible reason to shred you are hailing down on you to fight for our freedom. And this school board, doesn't even have the guts, doesn't even have the, you know, uh, testicular fortitude to say for the 90 seconds or so you're going to hear, oh, Canada, 
take off that damn cap. Show some respect. It's not about you. The national anthem and what our country stands for, it's bigger than what you are, and you should show some respect. And yet, here they're, they're going, well, you know what? We had different policies there. Some teachers are uncomfortable laying down discipline. I think it's shameful. It is shameful. And those men fought for us, of course, for our comfort, for our freedom, but also for for our for our country for yeah. our pride for our culture so um it's it is shameful to see that happening in schools for sure and especially with young kids like patriotism isn't something that we're ever taught we're not we're not taught that in school i can remember when i was in elementary school too it wasn't it wasn't pushed it wasn't it wasn't a big deal to we did have to stand for the anthem but other than that, it was nothing, it, we never really talked about it much. Yeah, well, I can tell you this. Um, there's two things that might correct this, course correct this. Obviously, the Toronto District School Board, which is uh, lefter than left can be, um, and makes seems to make the wrong decision every time uh, they have to decide on anything. Um, hopefully, parents, because it all starts with parenting, will instill upon their children that when you hear the anthem being played, you stand at attention. If you have something on your head, you take it off. And secondly, Jessica, um, I, I, I think back to a hockey game I attended once, and there was one Lugan in the section who had his cap on. And, I, and, I, and I, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he forgot he had the cap on, but I'll tell you, the, Several people in that section were saying, hey, buddy, take it off, right? And he did, right? So what I'm getting at is maybe this young generation can surprise me and by using peer pressure, put pressure on the person who is going out of his way to disrespect the anthem. Well, peer pressure definitely works. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely works. So I think it could be used for some good as well. And right. to, um, especially with young kids. They, ha they have to, of course, it starts with the family teaching respect yep. but it should they sp kids spend so much time the majority of their day in school so that respect should trickle over into when they're in school when they go home indeed and hey. it looks like uh sorry to cut you off oh here. not at it all looks like uh, gospel truth here gave us five dollars five canadian dollars and he says canada used to have the death penalty for sodomy however in spite of many convictions not one execution ever took place all cases were pardoned well you know um i wouldn't advocate uh that kind of penalty um and, and when you say sodomy I, I i'm not sure if you mean consensual or as, as an act of rape but um, hey we don't even have the death penalty uh, for first-degree murder. Um, I believe that was struck off the books in 1976, if memory serves. I think our actual last execution in this nation was 1962. And with murderers now, even a murderer who, oh, I don't know, um, takes a young child out into a field with a claw hammer and uh, bashes her into bits and leaves her for the animals uh, to, to, to eat. Um, talk about hard time. No, she goes to a, a, Neely, a, a native healing uh, center. Uh, you know, Jessica, that's the problem. It, it's not, it, it's the, the fact that people that commit the most heinous crimes are being treated like ch kindergarten children getting a detention. Um, and the feeling is, is that the punishment side of crime and punishment has been downplayed. It's all about rehabilitation. Now, I'm sorry, there are some people out there that might mock me for this, but they are pure evil. They cannot be rehabilitated. Well, yeah, that reminds me um, when I was in New York and I did, uh, I was talking to some people on the streets there in Washington Square Park about, um, it was at the time when Bernie Sanders was trying to push um, the voting rights for all. So, including incarcerated prisoners. Yes. Um, so I did talk to people, and there was I, I ran into a lot of Bernie supporters, <laughs> oddly enough, in New York City. And um, yeah, a lot of them, w majority of the people I spoke to, really, um, were agreed that pedophiles, rapists, murderers, they should have the right to vote. Well, and we have that situation in Canada mm -hmm. now. Um, there was a, 
uh, uh, an amendment uh, to uh, you know the the Charter of Rights and Freedoms here in Canada, which um, allows prisoners that are incarcerated for the worst, most heinous crimes imaginable to vote in Canada. And the apologists always say that you know this is all about the they call it the growing tree of justice. You know things like this should um, you know come to be uh, naturally. I can tell you folks, um, our commander, Ezra Levant, back in the day when he was the publisher of the Western Standard, I'll never forget this, it was a fascinating um, magazine feature, and it was about how the uh, architects of the Canadian Constitution, the ones that were still alive and that would go on record to talk, and they were, uh, were aghast at many of the amendments that have been introduced, uh, including the right for prisoners to, to cast a ballot. But that has existed in Canada for years, and I'm sorry, if the whole idea of prison is to take away your most fundamental human right there is, i.e. your freedom, Jessica, I don't think it's too much to ask that, sorry, you're getting your vote taken away until you're a free man again. Well, yeah, I, maybe it's unpopular to say, but I, I mean, I agree with that. If, you, if you're in prison for, t especially for taking somebody else's life, yes. what makes you think you get any rights at all at that point? Indeed. Let alone to vote. Yeah, shocking. But to change gears, um, Jessica, as you know, I was in Ottawa um, to see just an absolutely stunning spectacle take place in a bad way, that is. Um, it was the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights and it was about the re-implementation of Section 13 into the Canadian Human Rights Act. And what this is, folks, you may recall that back in 2013, uh, the Stephen Harper Conservatives uh, extracted Section 13 from the Canadian Human Rights Act. This is basically the pro-censorship, anti-free speech uh, uh, part of the, of the act. And it was basically um, something that was, as Mark Stein aptly noted, it was corrupt from the get-go in that there was one particular individual in Canada. Sometimes he was an employee of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Sometimes he was a complainant who was fishing the internet uh, under a false uh, pseudonym to find haters and then he would haul them before the Human Rights Tribunal and typically walk away with a five-figure check. It was absolutely disgraceful, but guess what? It's coming back, it would seem, but Jessica, what's even more disgraceful, I think, is that the same conservatives under Harper that took out this odious anti-free speech clause are now um, either sitting on their hands or voting for it. Andrew Scheer is absent without leave again. And what I'm stunned by, Jessica, is that talk about an item that speaks to the conservative base. Free speech, free expression, and Scheer and his uh, uh, subordinates are, are laying low on this like they, I don't know, they don't want to offend the mean girls at the CBC and the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail. What do you make of this? Well, actually this comment right here from um, Fraser McBurney, $5 Canadian dollars, freedom of speech, use it or lose it. You know, I... Is, that's right on point. And I, that's exactly like, I don't know what... Um, Shear's motive is here, but he's yeah. just digging himself into a hole and he's taking the entire Conservative Party down with him with that. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, contrary to the uh, generous donor there, um, the way free speech is working these days, it seems to be use it and you lose it yeah. in terms of financial mm -hmm. uh, gain or going to uh, prison. Um, but you just said something there that I think uh, speaks volumes, uh, Jessica. Andrew Scheer probably doesn't realize that what he's doing right now is so many self-inflicted wounds that when I read the comment section of all our videos, and it is quite remarkable to see how many of our 1.2 million YouTube subscribers, when they're lusting for regime change, it's not go Scheer go, it's 
People's Party of Canada, mm -hmm. go Max go. And I think the potential here, and so many of that base has been turned off by the weakness in the free speech issue, that maybe there are going to be some close writings uh, which will go liberal as opposed to conservative because of this unbearable weakness on the behalf of Andrew Scheer. And I think, oh, and, and, by, and on the flip side, we have, uh, I, I got an exclusive interview of uh, Mr. Bernier after question period on Tuesday. And you know what, folks? We're going to play a clip of that because, wow, the honesty and the conviction for free speech compared to Mr. Scheer, it's so refreshing. And fourth, and I think this might be the most disturbing of all, the conservatives there, and they turned a blind eye to this, even though it was the Stephen Harper conservative government in 2013 that repealed the odious, censorship-happy Section 13 from the Canadian Human Rights Act in the first place. Well, I'm very happy to say that I am now with Maxime Bernier, the leader of the People's Party of Canada. And um, Mr. Bernier, I can't think of a better person to interview regarding this because you were there back in 2013 when Section 13 was repealed. What do you make of, I don't know what it is we saw today, but what do you make of it? First of all, it's very disappointing uh, from my conservative colleagues. I was a conservative at that time and I fought to be sure that this Section 13 will be erased and, and, and withdraw, and we were successful. But I don't know what's happening right now with the political correctness in this country. It is too much. Uh, like you said in the beginning, the committee wants to rewrite history. Uh, they erase something that happened yesterday. We had that in a book called 1884. <laughs> it, 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 it's a shame. We are a democracy. And committee members saying that thing that happened yesterday did not happen anymore because we're going to erase everything. Uh, so it, it is, uh, uh, um, I don't know what to say about that. But the most important is the freedom of speech in our country. Uh, freedom of speech, free speech, is a fundamental human right. And we must defend them. We must be out there and defend them. And what my colleagues, conservative, the liberals, the NDP, everybody, you know, right now you don't have the right to say what you believe in. And if you want truth in this country, if you want to have debates in this country, you need to have free speech. I, I don't understand. I, I'm very... You know, seriously, folks, wouldn't you love to see the leader of the opposition, Mr. Scheer, say what Mr. Bernier just said? And I'm going to give Mr. Scheer free political advice that's worth at least six figures, and that is there are so many conservatives and even, and even non-conservatives pining for regime change in October. And what they want is more of a candidate who is Stephen Harper 2.0 and less of somebody who is increasingly coming across as Trudeau light. And I think we also have a, uh, another clip um, He's, uh, I would call him one of my heroes, and I think he's a hero to many in the conservative movement. It was Mark Stein, and he was gracious enough to give us an interview outside the chambers, because the first thing this um, Star Chamber anti-free speech pro-censorship panel did, folks, the first order of business was to ensure that the TV coverage was shut off. So, see, Section 13 is, hasn't even been re-implemented, and they can't wait to censor things already. So if Mr. Producer can uh, play a clip of uh, the, the great Mark Stein weighing in on this. Exactly. Well, 10 years ago all this came. I'm at that stage in the horror movie where you think you've driven a stake through the creature and you're just like walking away with the girl around your arm and you hear suddenly this ominous noise from behind you and the monster is back. Um, it's astonishing to me we're talking about bringing back Section 13. Um, it, it, it was useless. It was not needed. Um, essentially, uh, the, the Canadian Human Rights Commission were touting for complaints. Canadians are not hateful people. Even with people uh, that they don't particularly disagree with, don't particularly disapprove of, they treat with them in broadly civilized manner. And the problem with Section 13 
it, it, it vastly empowered government to mediate social relations between preferred identity groups. And all that's happened in the years since we got rid of it is that the identity groups have shifted in power a bit, uh, you know, transgenders up, feminists down, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, basically dead white males like me at the bottom of the thing. But the idea of a government bureaucracy mediating social relations between Canadians is absolutely repugnant. And Mark, I think... Mark well, you know, Jessica, I loved uh, Stein's horror movie analogy. You, you think you've uh, uh, killed the monster with a stake through its heart, it's, uh, and uh, only to see uh, much like, oh, I don't know, Mike Myers, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, uh, the thing springs back to life in this case, not seconds later, but uh, six years later. Um, I am uh, deeply worried that this is another tool in the Justin Trudeau uh, liberals toolbox to control free speech. So section 13, uh, you know, the pro-censorship uh, aspect of the Canadian Human Rights Act. Then you've got the carrot, um, 1.5 billion to the CBC, 600 million to various other media outlets of taxpayer money. And then you've got the stick. If you're not gonna play ball, if you're gonna bite the hand that feeds, guess what? We're meeting with the Silicon Valley giants. And uh, as Mark Stein said, kind of like a scene from a James Bond movie where the, the kingpins of Spectre are you know, thinking of how to control the world. We will shut you down by deplatforming you. As a journalist, this terrifies me. You're a young journalist. Did they, did they even talk about this in school? Uh, no, not at all. We, <laughs> <laughs> they did not mention it. Maybe because I went to a liberal arts college. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, uh, which we had some profs that actually, I believe, still work at CBC. Oh. So um, hopefully they're not watching this right now. Oh. Um, but yeah, I personally don't watch horror movies because I'm, <laughs> I'm a scaredy cat. But yeah, it kind of seems like we're... Living in one, slightly yep. as a journalist, and especially as a conservative journalist. Um, here I have uh, just a quick comment, $10 from I bet last, <laughs> probably thank you. butchering that. David, Jessica, and the team at Rebel Media, thank you. Your honesty and true journalism is so needed always. Thank God I found you. That's well, very sweet. Thank you. That made my week. Thank you, sir, for that. that that's wonderful. Um, anyways, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and of course, uh, this is all leading up to something uh, uh, hopefully cataclysmic for this Trudeau government come October. Um, but I got to tell you, with, uh, I've always said this, folks. Uh, Mr. Scheer has, at the time, a year to win me over, eight months to win me over. Now it's five months to win me over. Man, pick up your game because what I'm seeing, I'm just not digging because that's not my bag. Um, moving on to a file that is your beat, Jessica, and you're going to be going out into the field uh, uh, about a week from today. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, um, you know, you've heard of the Love Boat, that cheesy 70s TV series. Well, we have a Made in Canada uh, version of the Love Boat. It's called The Garbage Ship. It's where we dump tons and tons of garbage into containers. And I don't mean to be gross here. Some of which are entire containers of adult diapers. And um, you know what? Uh, what rube out there will accept this literal garbage? Oh, I know, it's the Philippines. Jeez, Jessica, what did the Philippines ever do to us that we would want to start a potential garbage war with that nation? Yeah, is it? Garbage war. Trudeau started a garbage <laughs> war. And you did mention that this is my beat, so I guess garbage is my yeah. beat, at least for the next uh, week or so, for sure. And yes, so I am going to the Philippines um, to actually report on the ground, which is very exciting to be there in person to get a real sense instead of getting all the filtered information through the media. Um, should be really interesting. I'm not too sure what to expect. Um, I feel like the average um, Filipino wouldn't really know about the story, mm. uh, which is just a hunch, but I'm very, um, very excited to, um, to actually get a sense of how they all feel about it. Well, it, and 
And, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention garbageship.com. That's going to be your specialized website. But you know what? We, we got to go right to the top on this. And that, of course, this being an environmental issue, that would be the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Jeez, I'll never get used to saying that title. And that, of course, is the uh, um, highbrow uh, Catherine McKenna. And look at that tweet, will you folks? Anchors away! You know, like, like we're going to be putting on a Broadway show or something. The containers of garbage have departed the Philippines and will arrive in Canada in four weeks where the waste will be turned into energy that'll power homes in British Columbia. You know, oh, so this is a, you know, you dummies out there, this is a good news story. That garbage that's been uh, adrift for years is coming back to Canada. But our mutual colleague, uh, Jessica Kean Bexty, uh, he went out to the eventual final destination of that garbage. It ain't pretty what's going to happen, eh? No, I, was, I <laughs> felt bad for him. I could see he was trying not to breathe the entire time he was reporting. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's so it's going to be in BC. Yep. It's going to eventually in a few weeks. Uh, reach that um, facility where it will be burned and apparently it's exactly what you think it smells like burning garbage yeah and you know what if we could mr. producer um, here's the eventual destination of, the, of this garbage that originated in Canada went to the Philippines is coming back and climate Barbie thinks this is a win trash to electricity facility and it's on top of a mountain for a reason the same reason why i'm going to try and keep this brief because it smells absolutely horrendous about as bad as you'd expect burning garbage to smell like now i don't know what's got minister Catherine mckenna so stoked about this facility yet she hates coal facilities uh, this is almost as bad as a coal facility and it's certainly worse than a natural gas facility uh, in terms of ghg emissions per kilowatt hour produced uh, my degrees in energy sciences and energy economics so it's nice to be able to talk about something that really is my wheelhouse something that the minister uh, Catherine McKenna cannot relate to whatsoever because she's totally unqualified to do the job that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has tasked her with so I'm going to do her a favor and explain to her exactly what goes on at this facility behind me when you incinerate municipal trash and household garbage about 20 percent of the mass that you're incinerating turns into something called fly ash and I'm sure Minister McKenna you don't know what this is so I'll explain it's heavy metals, so lead, cadmium, copper, zinc, you know, not great things for the environment, that's for sure, not great things for humans. Now, some of that's collected, some of it's emitted, uh, and that is just the particulate matter, some of the particulate matter, there's more. Uh, but a big problem here with these facilities is the gas that's emitted, NOx and SOx gases, that's nitrogen and sulfur compounds that are largely to blame for something called acid rain. Again, not another great thing to be super stoked about, Minister. Uh, but what's worse than that is that the carbon dioxide that's emitted here is two orders of magnitude more in uh, in mass than any other gas emitted here. Two orders of magnitude, it's huge. Like I said, it is almost as bad as a coal-fired plant. Now this is not even counting the greenhouse gases emitted through the transport of this trash across the Pacific to the Philippines one time. All of the CH4 uh, methane that was produced as it decomposed sitting on the docks in the Philippines. All of the diesel that was spent bringing it back across the Pacific as it came through Taiwan on its way to Vancouver. Uh, and then all of the diesel and gasoline that's going to be burnt as it is shipped up on trucks up this mountain to then be incinerated. My guess it is, is that it is going to be worse than even the most polluting coal plants Canada has to offer, the non-scrubbing uh, coal plants that were produced a long time ago. It will probably be worse than that. I'm gonna sit down and take a look at some Excel files uh, and come up with a number. You'll see that at The Real Key and I'll post it on Twitter when I actually do figure out what the number is, how much CO2 equivalents are emitted per kilowatt hour of this garbage production. Needless to say, it would have been better to just burn natural gas. Needless to say, Catherine McKenna, this is not something to be stoked about. It does illustrate your ignorance on the file, but it is par for the course. Over the last four years, we've seen what you have to offer, and it's not much. Back to you. Thanks, Kian. 
Wow, and somewhere in beautiful British Columbia, the leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May, weeps. You know, I think Miss May, Jessica, should make a beeline right to that garbage plant. Uh, maybe behind the wheel of her Dodge Viper, you know, the 640 horsepower um, retro muscle car <laughs> that she drove around the Victoria Day Parade in. I can't take this hypocrisy. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you can only laugh for so long, right? I have here uh, Aaron Smith, ten dollars. Thank you, uh, and he's saying good job on Tommy on the Tommy campaign, Jessica. Thank you so much. So I hope Thank you'll you. stay with me while I'm reporting on GarbageShip.com. And we have some more chats here. Proud Boys Calgary are back with two seventy nine. Kathleen McKenna equals climate banshee. Yes, the creature from Irish mythology that screamed a lot. That's pretty, pretty much uh, an apropos descriptor. Uh, and you know what, we, we're in the um, stretch run right now, Jessica. And by the way, thank you again, everyone, for your generous uh, donations. Every dollar amount is greatly appreciated. And this kind of ties into the Philippines because there's a Philippines connection and there is a garbage connection. Um, about a week ago, I was up in uh, Richmond Hill, which is uh, my uh, stomping grounds right now, to take in a council meeting. And uh, Councillor David West, um, he um, ha experienced a, um, a triggering canoe trip or something up the Don River where he noticed some uh, uh, plastic floating in the river. So, of course, he's decided to enact a, um, uh, a plastics ban, uh, especially targeting fast food packaging uh, in Richmond Hill, if not a ban, at least uh, me measures for reduction. And uh, the seconder of the motion was the Queen of uh, Ward 5, Her Royal Highness Karen Silovitz. This is the one who sometimes likes to go out and bully stage 4 cancer patients. Um, she wanted to make a profound exclamation point on Mr. West's um, motion uh, by talking about the environmental damage that is occurring um, and, and how we have to do something or else, well, here you go, save the whales. And this is exactly why we need to reduce our use of plastic. This whale was found on a beach in the Philippines. This was reported by uh, Pakistan Today. He had more than 40 kilograms of plastic in his stomach. He had starved to death because all he had eaten was plastic. You can see on the uh, bottom side of his jaw that's not plastic. Those are the filters that he uses as they swim through the ocean. These whales open their mouths and they suck in the water and the minute microorganisms that live in the water that they feed on. Instead, he sucked in 40 kilograms of plastic. And this, is all, this has been found all over the world. Wow. Well, well, you know, how did the Philippines ever deserve that? It seems like all the garbage is ending up in this beautiful country. And, uh, well, there was barely a dry eye on the house looking at this, um, you know, heinous death of one of nature's most majest majestic creatures. Uh, but Councillor uh, Greg Barrows, uh, well, let's put it this way, his bullshite detector was on uh, DEFCON 4 uh, because he was looking at the photo. And I don't know if you noticed, folks, there were people in the ocean frolicking beside this presumably dead and decomposing whale. And for that matter, why wasn't this um, carcass hauled away by the authorities? I mean, it's, that, that's a health hazard if ever there were one. So Craig Barrows got on the old Googler machine like the kids do these days and, um, well, this is what he found. The last thing I will say, and I, 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 I hesitate to, but I, I'm, I'm going to say it, the, the whale picture is um, shocking. And that's what it was designed to do. It's an art installation. And it was designed to make a point. Was it a real whale? No, it was not a real whale. It was an art installation. Holy fake news. Yeah, holy fake news, bat person. Um, yeah, so the whole thing was plastic. The contents in the whale's mouth and the whale itself um, 
I guess that shows what happens when you rely on Pakistan today as your trusted news source, uh, eh, Councillor Selovitz? And, you know, Jessica, what I found uh, incredible, uh, by a cosmic fluke, just before David West introduced that motion, hoping to ban plastics in Richmond Hill, um, we went into his office to try to get an interview in a different manner, ma matter, uh, rather three years ago, he was one of the councillors who was supportive of banning O Canada before council meetings, if you can imagine. It's, it's a story unto itself. And what we discovered when we looked at the tape is lo and behold, on the very day, just about an hour before he releases his motion about disposable packaging, there's a styrofoam cup, there's a, a plastic bag, there's foil wrapping. You see, David West doesn't want his lunch and his super coffee to get cold, and he's not going to carry around ceramics and thermoses, you know, because he's a VIP, understand? It's only the little people like you and I in our audience, they need to carry around this stuff. Again, Jessica, the hypocrisy and the double standard is just off the charts, and the fact that they tried to uh, implement this with a uh, an art installation pretending it was a real dead whale, I think is just absolutely egregious. Well, so it looks, sorry, <laughs> it looks like we have two more Super Chats just to quickly mention here. Brad Stacks with $2 and Karen Dworkin with $10. Thank you so much. Thank and you. But yes, this whole the whole climate change stuff, it's more of a talking point and then we're the ones that have to suffer with paper straws yeah uh, you know and, and I mean here here's um, something for all you climate hucksters out there starting with uh, you know the Zeus character uh, that would be Al Gore who I think left the White House with two and a half million in his bank account he's now worth a, a quarter of a billion I understand and then there's David Suzuki our home ground our home growing uh, shill and of course the likes of of uh, David West on the uh, local uh, scene. Just consider this, when you're preaching to all of the great unwashed uh, masses, uh, you know, all our, us little people polluters, why don't you lead by example? So instead of flying off first class in a jet to some conference, why not, oh, I don't know, uh, do teleconferencing? How about that? And how about instead of uh, Climate Barbie uh, driving around in a Chevy Suburban uh, and leaving the engine idling as you give your speech, how about you take a bicycle or public transit? How about that? This is the thing, uh, Jessica. Um, I'm getting a little tired of do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that worked maybe when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> but at this point, yeah. not so much. You know, I think that's, that's a profound insight to these people. We are kids. We're, we're a bunch of grubby children that have to be taught a lesson. And you know what? We're smarter than they think we are. We ain't buying what they're selling. Well, Mr. Producer just uh, gave me a talk that we have to uh, wrap things up. I was so hoping to get into what was different in the dating world, in your world, and what my world was like decades ago. Uh, I was looking forward to your insights, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for another time. Next Folks, time. thank you on behalf of Jessica and I. Thank you so much for tuning into Battleground. Thank you for your generous donations. And Ezra will be back in this space next Friday. Have an awesome weekend.